Hello and welcome to the Pandemic Prayer and Positivity webinar. My name is uh, Ahmet Keskin. I am the Executive Director of the Australian Intercultural Society. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of all the lands we're on and pay my respects to our elders past, present and emerging. This pandemic has presented us with many challenges. We are moving from a life of lockdowns to a new normal, which will present a new set of challenges. As we know, life is a constant struggle with a personal pursuit to being resilient, yet better individuals, caring for our loved ones and others in society. How do we as individuals and as a collective who profess to be people of faith find the strength to get through this pandemic? Are we hopeful for our future considering a pandemic, a natural disaster, health issues and unexpected disruptions could pop up in our lives and change the way we live? How can we live a life fulfilled? How can we live a fulfilled life? And as people of faith, inspire our respective communities to give individuals who are losing hope the shot of optimism they need. Here to address this question and more, we're joined by two esteemed panelists or three esteemed panelists. Um, but before we move on to them, I just want to remind people that they can communicate and engage with the uh, conversation by uh, asking questions on the chat section, or feel free to enter any comments there. Now, moving on to the panelists today, we're very fortunate to have the most Reverend Peter Andrew Comensoli, who was appointed the ninth Archbishop for the Archdiocese of Melbourne in 2018. He holds a Bachelor of Theology and a Bachelor of Sacred Theology from the Catholic Institute of Sydney. Archbishop Comensoli is the Chair of the Bishop's Commission for Life, Family and Public Engagement. He is the Chair of the newly formed Australian Catholic Council for Public Engagement, and a member of the Bishop's Commission for the Plen Plenary Council. Joining him will be Associate Professor Salih Hujen, who completed his Bachelor of Islamic Theology at the University of Ankara in 1982. In 96, he completed his Master of Theology at the University of Sydney, and finally his doctorate at Boston University in 2007. His doctoral research covered the effect of prayer on Muslim patients' well-being. He teaches at the Center for Islamic Studies and Civilization at Charles State University, as well as being a part-time lecturer at the Australian Catholic University. He is the author of four books, co-author of one book and a number of articles and book chapters. His research interests are Islamic spirituality, faith-based movements, Islamic theology, and interfaith relations. And to moderate the conversation, we're very pleased to have Nakiz Ansari, who is the religion and values educator at Amity College, and someone who's been involved in the interfaith scene for well over 20 years. Uh, she was also part of that peace squad that went to Orange straight after the tragic events of 9-11, which we commemorated just uh, last week. So thank you all for joining us. And McKees, I'd like to now hand over to you. What's wrong with the program? Thank you very much, Ahmed. And it's a pleasure and a delight and also my personal need to be in your midst and hear from your wisdoms and insights. And uh, like you mentioned, Ahmed, what an amazingly relevant topic, uh, pandemic, prayer and positivity, something that I personally would want to hear much more uh, about. Uh, Archbishop uh, Komensali, uh, Dr. Sali, usual, uh, a very warm welcome from you to both yourselves uh, as well. Um, I'll probably get right into it, being the only Sydney cider amongst these, uh, the both of you from Melbourne. Um, we have also, I know Melbourne has been leading this lockdown experience, but uh, Sydney has really also trying to catch up. And I think, I don't know about the numbers, but we're close to Melbourne in terms of how long it has been for us to have been in lockdown. And uh, from both your traditions, perhaps in that Abrahamic spirit and order, perhaps I'll start with uh, yourself, uh, Archbishop uh, Um, How does your faith tradition um, view a pandemic? And what is the wisdom of being tested with one's health really means in, uh, from your perspective and tradition? Uh, thank you, Marcus. And, and just firstly, hello to everyone who's uh, part of this uh, webinar. It's great that we'd be able to come together and dialogue uh, in this way. Uh, from our Christian tradition, uh, I think there are two dimensions that are important uh, to uh, consider in terms of faith and a pandemic. There's the tradition that, I, that uh, both uh, Muslims and Christians share, what we call the, the Old Testament um, but those, those uh, teachings that come out of the one God to whom we uh, worship uh, and the image of a pandemic that 
might be either God induced or human induced. We think of uh, perhaps uh, uh, the plagues that are associated with um, the uh, uh, the oppression of the, uh, the Israelites by the Egyptians at the at the, the great story of um, of that and the plagues that uh, that God called upon uh, the earth and uh, but we also have other images of human induced uh, uh, matters that were uh, to be dealt with. I name that because in our Christian tradition, we also have what we know as our New Testament, the, the story and life of Jesus and the uh, un, unfolding of that in, in our reality. And pandemic sits there in a different sort of way. Uh, we don't hear of the great natural feats uh, or disasters that, that, that God uh, perhaps have brought upon the, the earth always for a reason of amending the life of God's people. But we hear of other things, essentially human-induced, uh, whether they're plagues or whether they're uh, uh, oppressions or so on. And in all of those contexts, we see the God calling us to a renewal of heart, what we might call a conversion of heart, and uh, turning once again to the Lord, that we might, in turning to the Lord, also turn uh, more effectively towards our, ourselves and our own humanity. That's just a context, and in, in the sense of that, we... we uh, you know, we can look at our own lives, the testing of our own health personally. Now, we, we all do this all the time. We're, in a sense, in a common sh way doing this at the moment in this, this pandemic where we're suffering. But each of us individually, personally, in our own circumstances, are, are tested in our health and in our well-being, in our, um, in our capacity and vulnerabilities throughout our lives. And so the wisdom that lives in that testing is the wisdom of not seeing our lives just purely at this moment, but seeing our lives in the uh, horizon, if you like, that eternal life with God and, and living of the life of a person of faith might bring to all of that. So just as an introductory sort of thought, I, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Much to think about on that introduction and learn the renewal of hearts. Um, well, how we'll be going through this, ladies and gentlemen listening, and we'll have a set of questions and our speakers will uh, uh, give their responses as we go. Uh, Dr. Ujil, um, to you, um, how does Islam uh, view uh, the concept of pandemic and this test with health? Uh, well, first of all, thank you for this timely webinar. Uh, thanks to Australian Intercultural Society. Uh, there's no doubt that uh, this pandemic is a calamity. Uh, it is not that first time it's happening in the human history. So Quran views such calamities uh, as a trial because uh, human being, as a human being, we are a traveler on earth and heading to the eternity. So it, on, on this journey, uh, human being will be tested with many things. And one of them is, is pandemic. So there are some Quranic verses related to pandemic uh, uh, in the story of uh, Moses and Pharaoh. The, the Quran says, says that, I quote, we inflicted years of drought and crop failure on Pharaoh's people so that they, may, they might take heed. Whenever a plague struck them, they asked Moses, Moses, pray to your Lord for us by virtue of your virtue of the promise he has made to you. If you relieve us from the plague, we will believe you and let the children of Israel to go with you. But then God relieved them from the plague and gave them a fixed period in which to fulfill their promise. Lo and behold, they broke it at the end of the verse. In another chronic verse, it, it, it says that it may be well that you dislike something which God might yet make you a source of abundant of good. So what is the wisdom of that? As uh, Archbishop 
Common Soli mentioned the two views. Also, in, in, in Islamic, uh, among the Islamic scholars, there are two major point of views as well. Uh, when I was doing a research about that, I came across uh, more than 30 books that were written for the pandemic. And one of the interesting that uh, the author, the 15th century scholar, Ibn Hajar al-Afqalani, who lost two of his daughters and his wife in pandemic, he wrote a book, name of the book, uh, Little Contribution to the Virtues of Pandemic. <laughs> I was surprised, you know, is there any virtues in the pandemic? <laughs> uh, so uh, when, when I started reading the book, uh, I, I came across that he, it's like an encyclopedia, you know, discusses all things, including, you know, the medical issues, uh, prevention, and so on. So uh, he also bring the scholars point of view. And the first one is that the pandemic can elevate someone spiritually in a higher degree. And those who die due to the pandemic can be called spiritual martyrs, the first view. And the second view is that it can be, it can be like a wake up call. And particularly if there is injustice, tyranny, is a, a big gap between poor and rich are happening in the world. So there are, then it could be you know, regarded as a, as a punishment as well. So that's why there is not, not single view, uh, but uh, two major point of view ab about the pandemic. 30 books on the pandemic. Uh, that's, that, uh, that's something new uh, for me and very interesting. So it's like an ancient wisdom this test, uh, uh, gentlemen, uh, uh, taking off that and with the wisdom and the virtues that you tease this with uh, Dr. Saleh uh, of pandemic, uh, perhaps Archbishop, uh, what would uh, the role of prayer perhaps be in our lives uh, uh, from the Christian tradition here, uh, particularly during, I guess, generally th through natural disasters, but perhaps particularly also through this pandemic, what role does prayer play? Yes. Uh and an important question, I think, because it's a question that goes to uh, the sense of our humanity. Um, if as we, in both of our traditions, believe that we are made in the image and likeness of God, that every human being is precious in the eyes of God, and that uh, our relationship with God is something that is to be always nurtured, then prayer sits at the heart of that. Prayer is not just, though, in our Christian tradition, uh, something that I am involved with, with, with God, but there is a something of all of God's people collectively uh, and with one another sharing in that uh, gift of prayer. And what is prayer in our tradition? In a very simple way, it's it's a... It's a communication with God, a personal relationship, and the way that that falls out. I'd like to put to it the word friendship. I'd like to link the word of prayer and friendship, that the Lord who loves and cares for each one of us also wishes to know of our love uh, of the Lord. And so there is that relationship uh, that is such a deep uh, and abiding relationship of God for us in his grace and our uh, ongoing uh, struggles as human beings and, and people who are fallen in need of mercy and forgiveness uh, have been able to also come to the Lord. So prayer fits in uh, within this broader context that, that within which we are living in such a way that we can see ourselves as loved and cared for by the God who created us and who wishes for our good. And so prayer is uh, a, a means by which we can uh, ourselves learn and experience that gift. Thank you. Perhaps we'll come back to the prayer perhaps a little bit later on in the tradition uh, in the program to get a taste of that, Archbishop. Uh, uh, Professor Saleh Ujil, uh, how would your response be in the role that prayer plays in Islam? Well, thank you. It is another good question. Uh, first of all, uh, there are two types of prayer in Islam. The first one we call active prayer, which is uh, salat, like ritual prayer. 
And the second type is passive prayer, such as being patient during the disasters, calamities, and challenging times are types of the passive prayer. But also prayer can be classified uh, practical and verbal one. For example, uh, seeking treatment for illness, illness is a practical prayer, you know, going to doctor or uh, using medication and so on. But while we are doing this, on the other hand, you know, seeking healing from God is a verbal prayer. Uh, for example, you know, if someone is studying for passing an exam, uh, this is a practical prayer. However, alongside this, doing supplication for passing the exam is a verbal prayer. So in regard to pandemic, uh, first of all, taking all precautions against pandemic, such as you know, being vaccinated, is a practical prayer. Uh, asking from God for the protection and healing is a verbal prayer. So although both type of prayer are important, but the first one, which means taking precaution or you know, um, uh, being vaccinated, it is more important than the verbal one. So prayer uh, during the calamities, disasters, uh, alongside all precautions and medical intervention is a very strong tradition in Islam, by the way. But the one who, who pray, the ones who pray, know that there's a supreme power who can hear, hear them. When I was uh, you know, doing my doctorate, uh, I came across approximately uh, you know, uh, tens of books and uh, hundreds of articles, and approximately 80% of this research found that prayer provides comfort. If it's not physical one, but for sure it's, it's a psychological one. However, in contrary, about 20% of research argues that the prayer does not have a positive impact on, on patient well-being. Uh, but in this difficult time, I think uh, the, the action that we take for uh, you know, precaution against the uh, pandemic, uh, all of them can be considered as a practical prayer, which is necessary you know, for uh, fighting against pandemic. Thank you, Hojam. And in case anyone did not know that reference, Hojam, it means uh, a learned scholar in, in the Turkish uh, language. Um, so uh, thank you for that. Very interesting aspects uh, there, Archbishop and uh, Saleh Hojam. Um, question, uh, my next question, I suppose, will take us, uh, although there's a comfort in the prayer that you started as, uh, you, you've left us with the last question. Uh, but uh, currently, as you know, there is a lot of issues uh, with experiences with these lockdowns and staying at home and all the restrictions that has been imposed upon us. Uh, mental health has become quite rampant, uh, an issue and a challenge for our societies. Now, what would your faith traditions uh, have to say in terms of how can one build resilience uh, with our mental one's mental state and, and get through this pandemic and these lockdown experiences? Perhaps Archbishop Kamensley? Uh, I, I might start here with a, a kind of a philosophical uh, idea and the, well, not an idea, a reality that human beings are not just corporal beings, but also spiritual beings. We are both corporal and spiritual and uh, we don't have our bodies, but we are our bodies in, in, in that sense of also holding the spirit of life uh, that is a part of us. I mentioned that because I think in faith, to consider just mental health by itself, uh, we need to perhaps go beyond that. There is a mental spiritual health that is uh, significant here. And they both uh, uh, can inform the other. So where if I perhaps think of myself, I might uh, have a day when... Uh, in terms of mental um, uh, well-being and so on, I'm, I might be having not a, a very good day, but spiritually, I can be sustained. Um, and in, in that sense, we might be able to begin to talk with the word of resilience. Um, so yes, to acknowledge and to uh, give, give full credence to 
the mental reality of people's lives at, at this time in pandemic is really, really important. Um, I don't think any of us could put up our hand and say that we're not, we're not fatigued or struggling in some way or another. Uh, that the, the circumstances of our families um, uh, bring us down in, in a mental way. But also within that is the spiritual that can take us to a, the horizon of God. And, um, and it's that sense that I think we might learn to build resilience. Otherwise, we're relying simply on, you know, the mental and the corp corporal dimensions of our lives. But I think the other dimension is really important and uh, will help people to uh, get through this pandemic. Hopefully. Thank you, Archbishop. Uh, Dr. Saleh, how would you respond to that as well? Well, uh, uh, I think uh, Archbishop Komansoli uh, summarized very well. Uh, as a human being, we have also spiritual dimensions, psychological dimensions, and many other dimensions. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, there are, there's a good scientific progress in psychology so far. However, there's still a long way to go to understand the psych psychological aspects of human being or uh, also to understand the spiritual aspects of human being. So uh, for well-being, uh, I would like to respond with uh, the view of one of the philosophers of 10th century and well-known physician, uh, Ibn Sina or Ivicena. He classifies satisfaction in two levels. The first one, he says, uh, physical satisfaction. You know, we eat, we drink, we sleep, and so on. And uh, he says that also animals do this as well. And the second level is imaginary satisfaction. You know, each of us would like to have maybe a house, a car, a position, an income, and so on, or go for a holiday. And he says that uh, this is uh, imaginary satisfaction. It's not real. But uh, he says the real satisfaction is intellectual satisfaction. Because through that intellectual, intellectual satisfaction, uh, we get a very good mental health state. And he argues that in the peak of that, intellectual satisfaction were profits. Otherwise, they wouldn't be able you know, to endure the difficulties that they faced. Uh, you know, just imagine uh, in the life of uh, Jesus, peace and blessing upon him, or in the life of Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing upon him, and other uh, prophets uh, in the history of human beings, even, in the, even the great saints, you know, how uh, they suffered physically, but they were able to endure that difficulties. Why? Because of intellectual happiness. So then how to gain intellectual happiness? By helping others. It could be in different means, you know, it could be, let me, through teaching, through serving, private, providing food, visiting, you know, being with the patients, widows, elders, uh, you know, uh, the people who, who are depressed, loneliness, uh, you know, providing any kind of help. It will lead to the intellectual happiness and that will be permanent, you know, in the, in the human psyche. So that's why uh, for, for a good mental health, I think uh, as a human being or as a believer, and we should try to help others in regards of their faith or traditions, even, even helping any other creations. And also following the causes because you know, adherence to causality is a form of respect of their creator by following the causes. For example, the prophet uh, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, peace and blessing upon him, uh, he uh, encouraged people to seek medical treatment and medication. And he said, Allah has sent down both the disease and cure. And he has appointed a cure for every disease. So treat yourself medically, but use nothing unlawful. So as a human being, it's necessary to take steps for well-being. You know, uh, for, for well-being, again, if we can uh, utilize our five senses for the good things. You know, 
to, to look at the things positively, to hear the good things, to taste the good things, to touch the good things, and to smell the good things, that will have some positive impact in our mental health. And also, of course, as a human being, uh, you know, to have a, a positive mental health, a good mental health, we need to connect ourselves to the every creations. In Islam, we say that you can do through the names of God. For example, you know, if God created this cat, created me as well. You know, God created this tree and created me as well. Or God provides sustenance to anyone on earth and provides my sustenance as well. So through different names, uh, we can connect ourselves and being with the other creations that will bring kind of like a comfort and a good uh, mental health status, status particularly during these difficult times. Thank you, Hocham. Uh, much to take from that. Um, and I think you both actually touched on the next question that I was actually thinking of asking yourselves. And Archbishop uh, Commensally, you particularly touched also on the struggles that we, our families may be going through and, um, and the, the reality in that. Um, and unfortunately, as the numbers of these cases are uh, rising, so are the, those who are actually we're losing a lot of people, families have lost uh, their loved ones. Uh, I suppose an extension to this mental health and coping with that, how would our traditions or in particular from your uh, tradition uh, would be reach out and console each other from bereaving people of faith who believe in God and even those who actually may not believe in God? How uh, do our faiths offer a consolation in this time of loss of loved ones? Mm -hmm. uh in the story, what's called the one of our uh, scriptures, the Acts of the Apostles, which tells the story of the very early church uh, after the time of the death and resurrection of Jesus. Uh, in there, we hear of uh, the, the story of the early Christian community. And there's so many stories about uh, other people seeing in the Christians, how they loved each other, see how they love each other. Um, and the, the coming together as a community, the supporting of one another, even in time of persecution, uh, of uh, seeing that God has a purpose for their lives. I think all of these are ways in which um, we can reach out. So I'm called as a Christian to not be just interested in my life, and my relationship with God. I'm called very deeply, if I'm to be a true disciple of Jesus Christ, to go out to others and to find ways in which uh, we might stand together to accompany one another, to uh, be able to encourage each other and to put fresh heart in, into uh, uh, other people's lives. All of those sorts of ways are, you will notice, are about, in a sense, going out of myself to others. Um, uh, summed up very much in in our common belief in uh, that we are called to love God and to love one another. I mentioned those in, in all of that, in a sense, is what I might be able to do. But there are things I know to receive as well. I think this is important that uh, some in, in our situation at the moment, there, there perhaps are some within families who think they've got to hold everyone else up. And, uh, and in that trying to hold everyone else up in their family or in their circumstances and friends, they themselves can be so, um, uh, find it a struggle to do so. So it's being attentive to one another that's very important here, uh, that we might uh, see in, in someone that we love their own sense of loss and struggle, but also having trust that they may see that in ourselves as well. And so we might reach out to one another. Thank you for that, uh, Professor Salary. Well, first of all, uh, during these difficult times, it is necessary to focus on more brothers and sisters in humanity. That we have 
you know, connection with all human beings. So we should think that the life is a, a, a great gift of God and it must be protected you know, by taking all necessary precautions. And uh, you know, rejecting such precautions, uh, it is disrespect to the creator. Uh, because uh, what we know in, in, in Islamic tradition, uh, just I would like to give an example. Uh, one day Prophet Muhammad uh, noticed that a Bedouin came in and a man leaving his camel without uh, tying it. He asked to Bedouin, why don't you tie down your camel? The Bedouin answered, I put my trust in God. The prophet then said, tie your camel first, then put your trust in God. So the prophet Muhammad encouraged people to seek guidance in their religion, but he helped, he hoped that they take basic precautionary measures for stability, safety, and well-being for all. Uh, in, in other words, that he hoped that the people would use their common sense. So in, in another uh, saying, he said that if you hear that an outbreak of plague in a land, do not enter it. But if the plague outbreaks out in a place while you are in it, do not leave that place. So what, what we are applying today is a quarantine that you know, our authorities are asking us every day, you know, if you are um, exposed or if you contracted uh, the virus, just isolate yourself. I think in these difficult times, uh, each of us, every individual has responsibility. You know, every individual has responsibility towards God. That's, you know, different topic, but we have responsibilities towards each other and towards nature. So in that difficult times, uh, it doesn't matter, even if we cannot go and visit, but at least we can call. We can just talk to our neighbor, you know, with a smiling face. How are you doing? at this difficult time, or reach out to people you know, via phone. Uh, personally, I have been doing this, I saw the great benefit. The people are so happy that you know, I, I, when, I, when I called them. Uh, so that's why number one in this difficult time is important to listen to authorities. And if you do not take precautions and die because of negligence, it will be considered gradual suicide, which is the biggest sin in Islam. Or if we transmit, you know, a virus to anyone because of not taking precautions, it's like killing someone. And therefore, I think we have a big moral responsibility to listen to those who are, uh, have authority and also, you know, follow uh, the steps that are necessary to be taken. Thank you, Ho Chan. Uh, you actually took us right to the uh, next question I actually had about that moral responsibility of people during pandemic. Archbishop uh, Kamensley, what would your thoughts be on this uh, moral responsibility we share as people of faith, perhaps? Yeah. Uh, I, I want to just first comment on um, that great image of uh, the Prophet, Prophet Muhammad uh, that uh, Professor Salih has mentioned. Yeah. If, you, if you're not in a plague area, don't go into it. If you're in a plague area, don't go out of it. Um, it it's, uh, it's a very apt image uh, and advice at this time. So we each have moral responsibilities towards others. Uh, there can be, I don't say it's for everyone, I don't say it's of everyone, but there can be something of uh, a, a, a tendency towards perhaps a selfish attitude of, well, I'm going to protect myself and my own. Uh, but I'm not going to worry about anyone else. Uh, and that's the sort of attitude that then leads to um, a very odd um, attitudes around vaccinating and the, the value of that towards the good of others and so on. Um, so I think we have a moral responsibility for the, for the good of others, always for the good of others. And, and so... It, you know, what might I then do such that the other person, whoever that other person is, is that might be before me. It might be my neighbour next door. It might be the people I work with. It might be family members and friends. It might be strangers and whatever. But it's the person before me. We have a moral responsibility uh, 
uh, and so that I might do something that might be for their good uh, is to, in that way, live a life that is good. So it's not about me doing good things for myself. It's about how I might be good towards others. And in this pandemic time, it's things like uh, getting yourself vaccinated so that you're protecting others from uh, the, the worst of, of this, this um, coronavirus. It's encouraging people to um, uh, be mindful of one another and, and uh, uh, maintaining those sorts of things that, that we know are, are helping to minimise the spread of the virus. It's all those sorts of things uh, that are at play. And they're all about how can I work for the good of the other and not focus it back on myself. Thank you for that. It sounds to me that uh, lockdowns as we're experiencing it now in 21st century Australia and the world at the moment is actually a prophetic precedent. And there's a wisdom already given to us, uh, as you both have mentioned. I suppose within this ambit of moral responsibility, um, do you uh, see any particular uh, challenges perhaps that maybe in the way, maybe from faith traditions perspectives or just any particular challenges that might be or even opportunities uh, that we can utilize during this? I know we've touched on a few of them, but any particular one that comes to your mind, perhaps uh, Saleh Hojan? Well, I think uh, first of all, we should think positively, try to think positively how we can transform that difficult, difficult times uh, in a better way, at least, you know, we can uh, allocate more time for our, you know, spouse or children or brothers and sisters. Uh, so it can be a retreat. Uh, you know, I, 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 I personally, I took it as a retreat, like an academic retreat for me. I become more productive, by the way, you know, because I, 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 I am able to read more and, you know, contemplate more. And, and number two, I think uh, also is an opportunity for us, you know, to think about others, you know, for if you, if you look at, you know, sometimes news you see on the TV, uh, how the people are suffering in different parts of the world. But, you know, as, an, as a country in Australia, we, we are like, we are blessed that, you know, we don't have such uh, poverty or other many problems that exist in other parts of the world, particularly in, in Africa. So then we should think that, you know, uh, they are suffering there. We may suffer as well due to this pandemic. I think it's a reminder for us. As, as I said earlier, it could be a wake up, wake up call for us to care about others. I was reading an article uh, a couple of years ago and one of the Chinese uh, prisoner of war was taken to Manhattan after the second world war. And they asked him, you know, we were walking among the you know, tallest buildings and uh, what, what is impressive to you? He pointed out the trash bin. People were surprised. And why? What do you mean by that? He said that the food you waste, if you would send to China, there wouldn't be any war there. I think this is an opportunity for us to think about, you know, those who are suffering for different reasons. You know, how, you know, as a state or as an individual or a faith organization, how we can provide more help to them. I think. This is a great opportunity for us to think about that. And the third one, uh, you know, the Archbishop Comensoli, he mentioned in the earlier that you know, it's a returning to ourselves, our spiritual life is something that we think that we are, you know, uh, we are not going to die. We are immortal. We don't think about in the life hereafter. So this pandemic is like a ringing bell. You are mortal. You need to renew yourself spiritually. You need to be kind and good to everyone. Uh, that's, why, that's why I think, yes, we have a chance to transform it, such difficulties in, in positive thinking, particularly by thinking about the consequence of such pandemic. Thank you, Hojam. Uh, that positive filter of transforming everything to positivity, right? the vibe is quite there. Uh, and intellectually, and also the heart feels that. Uh, any comments, uh, Archbishop uh, Commensally, on that? Uh, if I might make just a couple. The first one I'd like to is just to pick up uh, uh, 
one of one of the words you use yourself, Mick, is that I think is important here. Uh, you were talking about that in a sense the pandemic is is sort of prophetic. And a word that I'd use that that it's for me at least that this whole period has been something of a revelation about our own lives. Each one of us can see uh, uh, something about our own lives, both in the light and in the shadows of our lives. And I think uh, more than that the pandemic has changed us, I would use more the word that it has revealed something to us. And I think that's an important um, uh, recognition. So when you talk about the prophetic, I might talk about the revelatory dimensions of all of this. In terms of how that then translates in, into how, uh, what are the dimensions of our lives by which the light might be revealed? Um, I, I'm, I'm personally not a great fan of the word optimistic. I'm a great fan of the word of hopeful. And I think hope is a much stronger um, and deeper reality than optimism. I can be optimistic about how, you know, the dogs will go this weekend in the footy, um, but I have no influence in that. But in terms of hope, there is something I can do. We hope for something that is good, that is to come in the future, but it requires work, our work, uh, so that it can be brought about. So, uh, I, I look to uh, the hope that is in the circumstances in which we find ourselves. And you, 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 we all know of stories uh, where uh, this time has been a time of coming together of families. It's also been a time for some families that have deeply struggled. I know that. And we, we, we need to acknowledge that suffering that's going on. Uh, but even suffering can be redemptive. Suffering is not just uh, a negative and evil, but suffering can bring can bring about good. Uh, so, um, and and to see where grace has operated in the lives of others, I think these are all ways that point to what is uh, a true hope for us. And in the end, hope is built on faith. Hope is built on faith. And may our faith may our faith abound. That's beautifully articulated, uh, Archbishop Commensally. Hope uh, and hope is built on faith. Um, you both uh, touched on um, the, the vaccination and immunization, perhaps uh, of as a almost like a moral responsibility from uh, your traditions. Now, how would you both? Uh, take us through in how to navigate uh, perhaps sensitively uh, the anti-vaxxers, those who are adamant in perhaps not taking that journey on. How should we navigate through, uh, through that uh, conversation uh, from each of your faith uh, traditions? Perhaps whoever would like to go, uh, Dr. Usual, if you'd like to start us. Well, uh, first of all, uh, politicization of, uh, you know, uh, illness or uh, you know corona virus is uh, a great risk uh, you know because when we face such challenges it does not make any distinction between poor or rich you know this faith or this faith believer or disbeliever so it is killing all of us therefore we have to work together to overcome this. I am glad that you know the scientists, doctors are working very hard to find, uh, it, they already have, but still it needs to be improved, uh, a cure for, for, for such disease. So if it is politicized or you know just based on the complex theory, that's a risk and that can cause many people death. So therefore we are living in a time during this pandemic that we need work together hand to hand to work together to overcome with such uh, diseases that is killing many many people every day and causing suffering of many people including people in australia and, and therefore uh, you know to be to to get vaccine uh, it, it it can be because also the 
the Mufti of Australia, Grand Mufti of Australia and the Australian National Council of Imams, uh, they also encourage the people with their fatwas that uh, you must be vaccinated. Uh, otherwise, if there's a life risk, then it is your responsibility that uh, it could be a, 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 like a gradually suicide. So, uh, you know, whatever it's been promoted in, me, uh, in social media, there's a risk of that. You know, it may cause some people that they are, they are not going to be vaccinated and eventually if they die. And the people who promote this will be accountable spiritually. Maybe, may not be, I don't know, law, law because I don't, do we have any law about that or not? I don't know, uh, I'm not an uh, expert on this. So therefore, it is time to work together and uh, to, to help each other with solidarity, with the unity uh, in that difficult times against the pandemic. Thank you, uh, Dr. Yuchel Archbishop. Uh, any thoughts on the anti-vaccination conversation? Here? Yes, I, I, I think it's probably worthwhile naming just the influence of social media, and in this case, a negative influence that um, in, in just about any other dimension of our lives, we would, and we do here in Australia, trust authorities like the therapeutic Therapeutic Goods Authority Association uh, to help us to understand what medications are good for us and what are not. Uh, they've done the research, they've done the testing, and so on. Uh, and we trust them in everything else. You know, our our aspirin or um, our statins for our heart disease or or whatever whatever form of medication that we're taking prescriptions and what have you uh we trust there so what's happened that we're not trusting that the same uh serious uh work is being done to ensure that these vaccinations are safe for us um i, I think uh we there's perhaps levels of fear that are within people and maybe one of my tasks as, as a religious leader is to help them to overcome that fear. Um, uh, but to see that that to, to vaccinate is not only good for their own well-being, it's good for other people who they love and want to care for. Uh, so um, I, I find the, the, the often very unsound and often crazy stuff that's floating around on uh, the social media, whether it's Facebook or Google or whatever you're going. Um, yet we, we have moved away from trusting and having a good reason to trust those who have responsibility for ensuring that uh, what is being offered is indeed uh, good and safe for us. Thank you. And, um... Speaking of social media, it's not exclusive to a particular section in our communities, but youth in particular uh, are perhaps a lot more um, uh, across social media. And um, just uh, besides the social media, just youth in particular, um, and coming from a school background myself, uh, they, the studies have actually been quite disturbed with the HSC and then going or starting university. And there's been quite a bit of an interruption in the mode and the style of learning that they've had to experience. Now, what would your thoughts be uh, in terms of how to give instill hope to youth uh, in coping with this and moving forward? Uh, perhaps, perhaps uh, Hojam, sorry, Hojam, if you could give us some tips. Well, uh, you know, I am father of four, four children uh, and uh, all of them above 24 and also three, three grandchildren. The first thing we do, uh, you know, we are having virtual family uh, meeting every Saturday for one hour. So we talk to each other, you know, I, I try to provide kind of like comfort and they talk. And so we talk, this is definitely the pandemic is always the issue on the table. Uh, I think we should talk to the youth and listen to them. Listen about their fear and because fear is one of the weakest emotion of human being and it easily can be manipulated so i think you know uh, as we have something and if i'm sick i go to doctor if i have you know if i have some engineering problem i'll, I'll go to an engineer i i will not go to an engineer for for my medical issues as 
uh, Bishop Comensoli mentioned that you know the authorities they are expert on this field. So uh, from time to time, I think we should also discuss this issue with the youth and listen to them, listen to their fear, their problems. To an active listener, uh, then we are there to help. We are with them to help. We can, you know, uh, work with them for helping. Thank you. Uh, Archbishop Kamensal? Yes. Uh, our young people are quite social media savvy. Uh, it's worthwhile remembering that. And they're, they're, they're uh, I think, probably uh, more capable of uh, distilling what is sensible and what's not sensible coming out of the media than us older adults. Um, so uh, in a sense, that I, I think the, the most important thing for our young people is that we who are older don't get caught up in uh, fear mongering and uh, and uh, taking on very strange ideas that have no foundation in reason and in good thinking. Um, so uh, we have a responsibility there that we, um, but also our young people can teach us as uh, Professor Sullivan's make, making as a point, I think, a very good point that uh, uh, let's listen to them. Uh, so I think that's important. I, I, other things though that we can do is also to speak a word of encouragement to our young people. Uh, I saw last week that uh, some information associated with 2020. So we had a very long period of lockdown and what have you. And uh, I think the fear one of these fears might be that our young people went backwards in their learning. But the evidence seems to suggest that's not the case. And that's, I think, important that we may be able to say to, say, those of us who are going to be sitting the, the, the VCE, um, you know, over the next few weeks, uh, that, you know, it seems to suggest that, that you're not going to go backwards. Don't be afraid. It's, a, it's actual one of Jesus' most common phrases, do not be afraid. And I think that's a, a, a very beautiful um, thing that we might be sharing with our young people. It is quite a beautiful one. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, as I'm looking at the time and respect with both your schedules, uh, we're nearing the, the one hour completion. And um, I'll probably have a quick re response if I could. Uh, a last question, perhaps, if you could give us both some tips on how to maintain a level of community and togetherness um, in this isolation. Like you've already touched on some tips. If any other tips that you had, some practical things for us to keep this connection. Sade Hojo mentioned the uh, Zoom sessions, family Zoom sessions. Perhaps anything else with the community? Archbishop Comensali, maybe? We've got our phones with us all the time. Make use of them, <laughs> not just for photos. <laughs> use, it, use them for talking <laughs> or texting. Um, very simple, practical things. Uh, if, you, if you're by yourself, as I am, make use of the the you know the, the single hub that you're allowed to, so that you're making some bit of human contact um, of of um, finding ways in which uh, you can bring a bit of fun and joy into family in the evenings or something, um, all very simple, practical things, you know, families, you know how you can um, find ways of, of reaching out to one another. Sure, anything, Sally Hojum? Well, uh, I, I could see that is happening already. It's happening between the families or in the community, such webinars and many things like this. I'm so glad that this is happening, but I think uh, it needs more to be done. More communication and conversations, yep. hopefully time allowing. Thank you, Hojam. Thank you, Archbishop. Uh, perhaps at this point, we could, if uh, I could request, uh, maybe we said we'll come back to the prayers, if we could have from your tradition, maybe uh, some words of prayer uh, to uh, before we hand it over back to Ahmed uh, to wrap up the session, please. Um, would anyone like to go first? Archbishop, please. Please. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'll go first. I, I thought I would um, uh, just offer a prayer that uh, the leader of our uh, Catholic tradition, um, Pope Francis, wrote recently, which is a prayer that's meant to be able to be said by all people of faith, uh, and uh, it's a prayer to our Creator. Lord, Father of our human family, 
you created all human beings equal in dignity. Pour forth into our hearts a fraternal spirit and inspire in us a dream for renewed encounter, dialogue, justice, and peace. Move us to, to create healthier societies and a more dignified world, a world without hunger, poverty, violence, or war. May our hearts be open to all the peoples and nations of the earth. May we recognize the goodness and beauty that you have sown in each one of us and so forge bonds of unity, common projects, and shared dreams. Amen. Amen. Well, uh, it is part of the Prophet Muhammad's prayer in the morning and in the evening. And he says, uh, uh, oh, protector, uh, you are a very good protector. Please save us uh, from the pandemics. So this is his prayer in the morning and in the evening that I think is timely that uh, we need to do it uh, at this time. Thank you very much and amen to both of that. Uh, I personally learned a lot and hope and optimism combined. I'm walking away hopefully with that vibe and some uh, advice, practical advice to you. So thank you very much, gentlemen. Over to you, uh, Ahmed. Thank you for that. And thank you, McKees, for moderating that uh, wonderful and insightful uh, conversation. A lot of words of wisdom there from both our speakers, Archbishop Comensoli. Uh, I love the way you, you describe this situation as a revelation and in the light and the shadow. And it's uh, it, it's confronting. It's there for us to, to deal with. And hope, like you said, is the uh, the way we can sort of use to work our way forward. And uh, Sailu Jam, thank you for sharing your words of wisdom from the Islamic tradition as well and seeing pandemic as a as a test and an opportunity for us to improve ourselves and, and reach a higher level both within ourselves and hopefully in the sight of our creator. So thank you each and every one of you again for sharing those words of wisdom. Um, just quickly in terms of a wrap up, just want to uh, give a quick notification of a couple of programs we've got coming up. On the 7th of September, we're working with the Equal Employment Opportunity Network to talk about anti-racism, something that's been unfortunately flaring uh, in the pandemic era, but we're looking at it from a, a holistic perspective and, and what we can do to help remove structured racism and the casual racism. So tune in for that on the 7th of September, October rather. And in the mid-October, we'll be working with the Institute for Economics and Peace to talk about the soon, their soon to be released, released ecological threat register. All those details will be on the Australian Intercultural Society's website. Tune in for more details about that. On that note, thank you again for uh, joining us today in this conversation. And until next time, goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye.